Hello and most welcome to 1763A. We will make a shorter episode on Stephen G. Affold's captivating pictures and liberating language. One reason why I thought it would be a good idea to do a little bit more is that in the next one and a half page, Athelt is getting even more into the picture. So we have something that could lie and brew in our minds. And the picture is, I'd say one, there are three things that are pivotal in the Wittgenstein thinking. The picture is most definitely one together with aspect seeing and ambigui ambiguity in language together with language games. And as I said earlier, there is constantly a family resemblance going on here. There is not likeness. Here you have, very good color. The picture is idle. It doesn't tell until a sort of, you could call it a decision is made. We could compare that to the previous read with Meredith until we actually do the serving of the libation or the communion in a most specific way, we need to understand a movement can be done in on a skill level that is quite, has quite a span. And in the movement, uh, and that we have from uh, Barbara Tversky, intelligent people, and she looked, I think, especially at engineers, when they move, even if they don't do their work at the moment, their way of moving about is much, much more frag, fractally complex. It has more memory. It has more ability to learn because it's all in the movement. And of course, all the apostolic succession of Christ is in the movement, not only in the writing. So definitely not solo scriptura, as Martin Luther said. It's far from the case. I would say that that is actually one of the gravest attacks on Christianity made. So it's in the doing or in the decision or why not the collapse of the superposition as my colleague Kale uh, suggested with a Schrodinger cat. So until the moment there is a movement in thinking when we decide to accept a thought or to reject it or to leave it to the side, nothing of meaning or grave meaning for action is there. But be careful here, uh, I made the mistake and I may, I'm going to make it again. It's very easy to fall into the Aristotelian trap of thinking that the unmoved thought, the idle thought or the idle picture is a potentiality like a seed that have to, and this is very important, have to be developed once it's germinated in a special direction. Do not fall into that trap. 
that was taken care of Paul Johnston in Rethinking the Inner. And I suggest your listeners to go back to those episodes and look at the problems that evolve if we fall into the inner trap too much. And since I'm standing here, I ask you kind of to keep the text a bit further down this time. Uh, the screen. I recommend maybe, yeah, that perfect, perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. Somewhere in that vicinity. And I continue. It's the last paragraph on page 272. To this end, I want to look specifically, if briefly, at some of the most salient conditions on the language game of telling. In this I am guided by Wittgenstein's remark at paragraph 363 that we regard it too much as a matter of course that one can tell anything to anyone. And heeding this questions, his questions, but how is telling done? When are we said to tell anything? What is the language game of telling? I do not mean to suggest that telling is a kind of master language game. However, I focus on telling because it involves two dimensions which are clearly central to many acts of speech. In particular, telling involves the dimension of counting or tallying, which might be thought of most basically as bringing objects and experience under concepts through counting them as one thing rather than another. And telling involves the dimension of recounting or accounting, which might be thought of most basically as addressing oneself and one's counting of objects and experience to others. In virtue of involving these two dimensions 
telling might be said to represent a kind of basic language game. And the necessities involved in the language game of telling will be at least at a general level informative of the necessities involved in engaging in a wider range of language games. If we begin from the idea that to tell is to inform someone of something or to direct attention to something, then perhaps the most immediate condition on telling is that one must be in a position to tell what it is, what is told to the other. But then, what are the conditions of being in a position to tell something to another? These conditions will include at least the following. First, there must be something that one has to tell. That is, one must know something or have noticed, being struck, amused, interested, surprised, alarmed, heartened, or the like by something. Second, what one has to tell must be something that the other is in a position to receive. That is, one must know, believe, imagine, surmise, hope, or the like that the other is in a position to comprehend what you tell and equally importantly to be informed Equally importantly, to be informed, interested, struck, amused, surprised, alarmed, heartened, and the like, but by what you tell or by what you direct attention toward 
we might say generally that telling depends equally upon difference and similarity in the positions of the parties. And that in telling, one is articulating that difference and counting on that similarity. Telling depends upon difference in position in that if there is to be anything to tell and so if one is to be able to tell there must be something one knows has noticed being struck by, amused by, and the like. which the other does not yet know, has not noticed, have been struck by, seeing what there is to be amused in, and the like. This is as at least part of why undertaking to tell another something can sometimes give offense. You think that you can tell me that is I don't already know, haven't already noticed that who do you think I am? Telling depends upon similarity in position in that if one is to be able to tell the other must be able to understand what is told as well as why it is told when and how it is That is, the other must be able to understand that there is or why one might have thought that to be. Room to tell and reason to tell just what is told in the specific circumstances. This is at least part of why undertaking to tell another something can sometimes fail. 
What are you saying? I do not get it. I don't get your drift or even simply, huh? telling them one is articulating a specific relationship between oneself and another by articulating one's own position as well as the position that one imagines the other to occupy. This articulating of a specific relationship between oneself and another importantly involves various forms of self-revelation. In telling you this and in telling it as I do here and now, I reveal something of myself in revealing my judgment of what in the given circumstances I find noteworthy, surprising, interesting, amusing, and the like. and I reveal something of myself in revealing my judgment of your position. Of what you might also find noteworthy surprising, interesting, amusing, and the like. And I have not already noticed further to speak of revealing one's judgment of what can be told or of what is worth telling in given circumstances and between particular individuals is to emphasize the fact that telling takes place within a field of open possibilities. Or better, it is to emphasize the fact that telling 
takes place among individuals who recognize possibilities, recognize that different features of a circumstance might stand out as significant and that this significance might itself be taken differently. In telling, one is opening up and articulating this field of possibilities between oneself and the other. One is opening up and articulating the field of possibilities for salient responses. Challenges to how the circumstances in which one speaks might be understood. Rearticulations of one's own position and the position of the other and in general for the continuation of conversation. Bearing in mind this background of a field of possibilities that is invoked and articulated in telling, I believe that we can also say that in telling, I reveal something of myself in revealing my desire, as well as something of the shape of my desire for your recognition of the specific position that I am taking and in revealing my desire to know your position In articulating the position I am taking and my judgment of the relationship between us in telling, I am projecting the ground of judgment and of desire from which I speak and so projecting the ground of my intellig intelligibility. The sense of my telling of what specifically I am telling in using the words that I do as I do in just these circumstances depends upon 
my projecting this ground through my revelation of myself and of my position If you are to understand what I tell, you must be able to understand my telling. And if you are to understand my telling, you must understand or be able to gather the position that I am assuming in speaking. You must be able to discover the ground of intelligibility that I project in speaking. That is your understanding what specifically my words might mean in the particular circumstances is inseparable from understanding what I mean and what I am doing with my words. One can, perhaps, say anything at all to another, or at least at another. However, one can only tell another something if the other is able to comprehend what is told. And that will be inseparably connected with understanding you and understanding your telling when and as you do. And since this is supposed to be a short one and my energy is running out, we put the stop there. And we are currently on page 274. There are a family resemblance once more, you could say. And that family resemblance here is with what we previously talked about the picture. That's why I said this is going to have some semblance little semblance, but there still would be some. You could say, and give, be patient with me now, you could say the unspoken words are similar to the idle picture. So imagine that you are approaching someone, maybe you could remember this if there is an important thing you want to say to that person. Maybe you're 
maybe about to propose. No, that's not a good example. But it was important, but you had many different thoughts about what you were going to say. It is yet undecided. And neither can you say it was a germ because almost always <coughs> you will say something completely different from what you planned originally. But it would be in the same direction as we see in the second paragraph of page 273. So just to repeat, there is a semblance, there is a family relation with thought. They're not identical, there is no likeness, it's family resemblance or family relation. If we begin, <coughs> sorry, if we begin from the idea to tell is to inform someone of something. Or to direct attention to something, then perhaps the most immediate condition on telling is that one must be in a position to tell what is told to the other. So we have all these conditions and you must know something and here many examples are given. Surprised, alarmed, heartened, amused, all those things goes into what moves the speech, what the words will tell, what they will become. And I'm not talking about the phrasing or how it would look in the written format. We know the written format carry very little. It's all down to other factors that have been proven by phonetics fractal factors, movement in the bodily posture that brings what is to be brought over. But I can give you an open uh, structure example. One example is coming from some oriental languages where the most important part of the sentence is put at the very end. It's usually somewhat formally called subject, object, verb order. It's quite different. And I don't know if any European languages, other in small exceptions have that. It makes a possibility for the person who's going to say something to get into the context, to feel in where the people are amused, interested, surprised, not so interested. So they can put the verb at the, the verb is put at the very end. So you might start out I by saying to change the value of the British pound, I suggest should be done, or I think should be done, or I heard it should be done. Everything can be changed. And of course, this is incredibly fitting with the Wittgensteinian picture 
that the meaning is not decided or the sense of it, which would be more in line with how he expresses this, is not decided, it's idle. And if that were not enough, if you in the end say the verb, I propose or I think it should be done, the very last thing you can do at the sentence is to negate the whole thing. And I see no other purpose for this fantastically practical from a Wittgensteinian point of view, but extremely different from a European view where we actually start without uh, being able to a great extent to get into how the talk will be moved. So you see there is a family resemblance with the idle picture or the thought but there are also differences. Your own reaction is also part of that. It's not unimportant. And that is what Wittgenstein called getting moved by, like the thought is moved. We can continue further down. There is an example when you go too far in reading it. You think that you can tell me if you read too closely and you don't pay notice to what is already understood. It's an excellent example where things have already moved, but you haven't quite got into it. And I think uh, if you, from a normal analytical position, that would be uninteresting, but it does have a significant role. And further down, you have another aspect of it. And this is at least part of why undertaking to tell another something can sometimes fail. And you get a response like, what are you saying? I don't get it. I don't get your drift. Or even a simple, huh? And that is, of course, in a way, also a part of the movement. You could call it a failure, but it's it, you can have your own reason not wanting the other person to get your drift. And it can also be you give up trying to try. There can be so many different things. And now I think you can see even the spoken words is not the final judgment. Something that we often see in Jacques Derrida and especially in Life Death, where despite their own intentions, Jacques Monod, Bernard and Kangelheim and others François Jacob especially, are not even, what can you call, aware of what sort of argument they're using. Religious, essentialist, metaphysical. 
not even the written word is the last step. There's still some movement possible, but it's also important to understand that the important move when it's no longer idle is somewhere in that process. And then there is a matter of degree. And if you would like to say that it is when it's actually spoken, when it's recorded, or when it's put to paper, it's all a matter of degree. So this is far more complex than any academia would say today. There's just two positions, an idea possibly, and that idea is the germ of what's going to be written. And the first written thing is the original. And then you change your idea and write something else. And already there, you get an understanding, wow, this is much more complex than I previously understood. It's very well written on the next page here. The second sentence, further, to speak of revealing one's judgment of what can be told or what is worth telling in a given circumstance, in given circumstances, and between particular individuals is to emphasize the fact that telling takes place within a field of open possibilities or better it is to emphasize the fact that telling takes place among individuals who recognize possibilities who recognize that different features of a circumstance might stand out as significant <clears throat> and that this significance might itself be taken differently. So listen to that complexity. Kalle, please step in. Yes. So this shows that what we have gone through earlier in Affel's paper is that the implicit is more important than explicit. The explicit things you find in a dictionary, but the dictionary doesn't say you anything about irony. Uh, let's use this example of proposal. Uh, you could say, will you marry me? Nonchalantly, but this nonchalance you, be, you cannot capture in a dictionary. No. Uh, I don't think even a computer perhaps understands it. If I say, will you marry me? And Kalle, we, we have the whole range of things that are half serious. This is what especially Jack Derrida is playing on. Between absolutely serious and sarcastic, if that <laughs> is so, so, so to speak, the uh, uh, last level of irony, we have at least 50, 60 values. And often it's a mixture. <laughs> mm. Indeed. And then let's say that I say, Mary, will you marry me nonchalantly? Then the other person can say like this, what are you saying? I don't get it. I don't get your drift. Or simply, no. ha. Ah, exactly. Or other, <laughs> or other, the other can give you a slap in the face. Uh, if it's done nonchalantly. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have an example here. It's what 
uh, from uh, United States to Japan, Japan. I think it was in 1941 or something like that. And uh, what the proposal was in Japanese was 60% uh, at face value and 40% uh, ironical or not serious. And I think that's rather typical of very important sentences. They are always on the scale because mm. how it's received, who's reading it, who's who's there listening, who's reacting, under what circumstances, at what time, for what reason. That that is millions of things. Uh, indeed, indeed. And speaking of um, philosopher. Uh, uh, marriages. So, Austin philosopher, you had these marriage utterances. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Can you repeat to our audience uh, what Austin thought about this? Uh, if you have well, speech. He, he, uh, he wasn't too happy with uh, phrases that he sought. He called, I think he called them parasitical on proper language. Mm. because they did not have a communicative ordering or he had a huge list of possibilities that a language could take. But for instance, in uh, a court of law, in a church where somebody gets married, something is done. In, and it doesn't have a truth value, it's an act. And I think he had specific problems with theatres and novels, because the sayings there were neither true nor untrue. It was saying, I sentence you to 10 years uh, in the castle. Mm. It's, it's not a normal sentence, according to Austin, although Austin was very sharp otherwise. Jacques Derrida took that up. So you see, it's a whole range of how words could work. And it's not a priori limited. And I think that's your point, that, that Austin tried to limit what language was sort of by a rule and saying, hmm, language should be like me talking to person B and asking that person, how's, how are you doing today? And that person answer, it's an exchange of information. I could give orders. Uh, I can talk about the past and so on. But he saw there were exceptions and And of course, in the marriage, it's just family resemblance. Mm. It might as well, as we talked earlier, could be a toast, could be a libation. Mm. It still has a position in the language game. Mm. So what uh, uh, did Austin possibly able to explain irony? And on once in language, uh, say that you uh, show up to marriage um, branch, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and a computer uh, would have understand it. Okay, a computer might notice this is person, person is uh, sliding his verse, uh, or I don't know, or oh, simply say this is person is sober, but he promises a marriage with this in a nonchalant way. So, how would uh, Austin explain that? You would say uh, those are exceptions and they should not be taken care of. And I think it's an excellent example how, uh, how we mistake uh, language and assess, we start thinking they, they need to 
follow the classical laws and they need to be in a certain way following a certain rules and uh, as you just mentioned you can turn up uh, at your own wedding drunk and uh, you can be absolutely honest with what you say but you being drunk will change everything of course will it have the same meaning what sort of meaning will it have yes it can have a meaning but you can then of course this is because it's been a judge uh, of course mm. Yes, it's a complicated issue. <laughs> it's up to the judge <laughs> and, uh, and to the bride as well, of course. <clears throat> well, perhaps we should end there, Hans. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for bringing up good old Austin. He's, he's both excellent and uh, extremely intelligent, but it shows that even if you Try your best. You will. Uh, you could always end up in this a priori idea of that language and that. Or I, I can I can say like this: the mm. problem, the the mistaken belief we have is that mm. all parts of language has similarity, mm. and that there is something called language with a big L. And mm. everything that is contained in language has a similarity, are of the same sort. Mm. That is absolutely wrong. There are parts of language which is so far from each other. Think mm. about the family. If you go to the second or third cousin, and that cousin's second wife, her children, and uh, siblings to them, something like that. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, 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 there's no identity. It's not sharing any traits whatsoever. Mm. And that is a thing that is very hard to accept. Mm. Mm. Very helpful to me has been looking into languages that is that are so different, where, for instance, descriptive sentences, which is very common in Western languages, mm. are, are rare, extremely rare. <laughs> mm. And that, that is just odd. Yeah. It's just odd. Mm. And mm. then you understand, well, that is not a language that has the same purpose at all. It's more like uh, football has very little in common with as you mentioned earlier, mm. marriage. But mm. according to the uh, German spiel, they are all sort of spiel, games. Mm. Mm. Spiel? Can you repeat the word? Spiel. spiel. And what does it mean? Spiel. S-P-I-E-L. It has an extensive game. meaning. Game. It includes game, it includes oh, yes. sport, it. it includes so okay. many things. Mm. Like the spirit, it's very similar. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's much wider than English, and it's definitely much wider than the Swedish spela. <laughs> mm. Mm. I, I imagine they are related, but speed is much wider. Well, I think, uh, thank you very much, Kalle, for uh, your comments. And I will now conclude the A part of this captivating pictures. And I say thank you very much for listening in, everyone. And have a good day, good evening, or good morning, wherever you are. Bye-bye for now.